From the top of the town at 715 Main Street in historic Deadwood, it's time for another episode of the DTC Blow and Smoke Podcast. Finally. Featuring from the Deadwood Tobacco Company team, Wild Bill, Consuela, Grimy Grimes, Jaken the Kid, Stash. Produced and directed by Ethan the Preacher. And I am your host, I Candy Randy. Hello and welcome to episode number 40 of the Deadwood Tobacco Company Blow and Smoke Podcast. I am your host, I Candy Randy. Joining me for today's podcast is, you know him, you love him, sometimes. Fresh out of the humidor, brand new stock of Gurkhas came in today. Everybody, Mr. Wild Bill. Wow, that sounds like you love him, you know him with enthusiasm. <laughs> you know, you got to do what you can do. And then, of course, as always, behind the board, mixing, mastering, our director and creative genius behind Deadwood Tobacco, the preacher, Ethan. Good morning, Ethan. Good morning. Special episode for you today. It is actually the first of three that we'll go over in a little bit, featuring some heavy hitters in the premium cigar industry. But we're going to start where we always start. What are we smoking? Ethan, what did you pick today? I've got the Headley Grange, which is one of my longtime favorites. Crown Heads. Fantastic. Very nice. Bill, what'd you go with? Mel Diaz. A little short fucker. <laughs> <laughs> that's the, uh, that's the uh, complete description. Yes. Very good. And I went with, I wanted something a little bit lighter today, a little bit light medium. I went also with the Crown Heads. Only time it's probably been smoked on the podcast because it's a special edition from a PCA release, the Crowned Heads Sfumato, see if I can say it, Sfumato in C major. <laughs> Ecuadorian Canadian uh, Shade Connecticut wrapper, medium, a little bit of vanilla in there, a little bit of spice, but nice uh, with my first light beer of the morning. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And now, here it is, the first of three episodes coming your way. Episode 42 is going to drop November 21st with our good friend, Christian Arroyo from, of course, CLE Arroyo. Then December 5th, we've got episode number 43 featuring 
someone that both Wild Bill and Crown Heads Miguel Shodel said has the opportunity, we were just talking about this off camera a minute ago, to join the Mount Rushmore of Master Blenders here in another decade and a half or so. Mr. Nick Melillo from Foundation will be with us for that one. Last but definitely not least, joining us from Tennessee, as you can tell from his coffee cup, the co-founder of Crowned Head Cigars and good friend of Deadwood Tobacco, Mr. John Huber. Welcome, John. And the crowd goes wild. Hey, 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 hey. What's good? You look relaxed. Everything must be uh, going pretty well down there. Um, don't let the, the facade fool you. It's, it's like the duck, you know? You see the duck, and they're like very calm and placid, and underneath their, their feet are going like... Yeah, it's kind of the same thing now. Well, we'll take it. Well, we're, we're thankful for Go your ahead. time and, and uh, coming on to join us. Um, since we always do it to start the podcast, uh, John, what are you smoking? Um, I am not smoking the little fucker. By the way, Bill, I'm going to write that down. And I, think I see an LE coming down the pike in 2024. Mil Diaz, short little, little fucker. <laughs> make an acronym, SLF, the short little fucker. Um, I'm smoking a Lavaretta number 54 today, gentlemen. Very nice. And that's a, my third star of the day, actually. <laughs> ah, yeah, that's, yeah, that's pretty impressive. Bill, is that your third as well? One, two, three. No, this is four. Four. There you go. Atta boy. I was going to say, do you need to take your shoe off to count that high? <laughs> yeah, because I have I like, <laughs> ugly toes. <laughs> <laughs> Tho t- thotums, whatever you call them, thumb toes. Mm-hmm. So, uh, John, when we reached out to you uh, yes. to come on the podcast, uh, your reply was anything to support my guy, Wild Bill. Could you tell us a little bit about how you and, guy, you and this guy got linked in the industry and a little bit about your history with him? So the first time that I recall meeting Bill was... It actually uh, during the rally at Deadwood. Am I correct? Correct. You were you were, you were with Ashton at that point. Yep. And I was with CAO at that point. And back then, I don't even know what year that was. Two thousand and five, six. I don't know seven, whatever. Um, and basically, the former owner of Deadwood would bring a bunch of this motley crew together of guys from Ashton. I believe Christian was there. Myself, um, Fabian, when, when he was with Drew Estate can't remember who else was there but anyway we all got together stayed at that this house and then we would just get literally like bust over to the store and just sell all week long at uh, during the rally and then we'd go back to the house get pissed drunk together smoke a bunch of cigars get a couple hours of sleep wake up and we just had we became fast friends we just everybody just bonded and it was just one of those great memories that i have of doing a couple of two three of those events actually and that's the, that's the first time i met bill yeah. Very nice. And uh, Bill has continued that tradition. We have one coming up here in, uh, well, actually this week, we all gather at the uh, uh, Wild Bill Mansion and have a little uh, cocktail and a cigar and a nice. cook's dinner for everybody. It's a, it's a wonderful thing for us to get to know not only the reps, but uh, from beer and also from the cigar industry in a nice way to uh, kind of just unwind before the hectic uh, event starts. See, back when I did it, they didn't feed us. We didn't get food. Nobody cooked for us. Oh, no. We just kind of like... Right, am I right? That's there absolutely no right. There was nothing to eat. No, there was there was plenty to drink, nothing to eat. You lived on tobacco and alcohol, and you just yep. grinded it for like a week. True. That sounds that sounds about normal. I like that. <laughs> That's pretty good lifestyle. It's different now. <laughs> it is. Yeah. It is. It is. Yeah, I bet. It's got a, different for me for sure. <laughs> got a little soft in your old age, there, Bill. Amen. Yeah. Perfect. So, John, you've got an interesting background from what I was uh, able to find reading up before we had this interview. Uh, for someone who is in the pre- uh, premium cigar industry, I don't think there's a lot of uh, kinesiologists out there to start with. Can you give us a, a <laughs> no, quick... I'm not, I'm not one. <laughs> <laughs> I came close. Yeah. I came close. You're almost there? A, yeah. That was a long time ago, my friend. Yep. Yeah. Grew up in the, in the Bay Area, and then you spent a little time in L.A., and uh, then mm-hmm. ended up in uh, Nashville. Can you tell us how all that all happened? Correct. Uh, grew up in, in the city in San Francisco, left when I was 17, went to L.A., um, went to college there for four years, and then uh, stayed another, what, eight or nine before moving to Nashville. Just got burned out on, on L.A. Um, L.A. kind of fried me a bit um, and just had a new start here. And then really when I, once I got out here, it was just a matter of, okay, well, all right, now i got to grow up and be real about life. What is it What is it that I want to do? You know what I mean? And, and I want to choose carefully so that I don't get stuck doing something I hate doing. So after a lot of soul searching, um, 
I just really kind of pinned it down to either wine or cigars, <laughs> two vices, right? There you go. So, um, yeah. And then just, it was just all very like kind of serendipitous, like destiny. Like I found CAO was just starting out here. I pitched myself to, to get a gig there, got a gig there, kind of worked my way up. Um, and then CAO was sold. Um, and then that company was acquired by STG. And then they were going to ship everything off to Virginia. I said, see you later. I'm not going. And Mike Condor and I started Crown Heads uh, a few weeks after the end. And here we are. Still trucking. A decade later. Yeah. So that was like the, the Reader's Digest condensed version right there. That's Real. the cliff note. Yep. So did you, ha- cliff note. So did you have any interest in the premium cigar industry? Or were you a cigar smoker before you came to Nashville? Or did you just find... Um, no, not at all. I, I literally... Um, kind of stumbled into it i was actually i had moved to nashville and i was flying back to california to visit my family and i was like i need a good guy's gift uh for my father and um i was literally driving down the street and i see this cigar store it was uptown smoke shop and i'm like that's kind of a cool like guy's gift let me go check this out so i literally walk in there and then as soon as i walked in and i got inside the humidor it was like this you know it was like the movies like the the sky open it was like this epiphany like the smell of like the cedar and the the tobacco and everything i was just like oh my god this is awesome what you know what is this all about so anyway by the little selection of whatever i got went back smoked a few with him by their pool flew back here and i'm like i gotta figure some more of this out what is this all about and i found cigar fishing on a magazine in the wine store it was the one with the george burns cover and uh, I just read it cover to cover and just I would like to start saving up some money to, to buy a few cigars each week. And then I would take little cliff notes on the cigar. You know, I was the geek. I took the band off. I pasted the band on the little tasting notes, gave it a rating, you know, that whole thing. After doing this for a while, I decided this is what I want to do. And I don't know how I'm going to get to do it, but this is what I want to do with the rest of my life. So I went back to that cigar store. And I asked them, you know, hey, can I get a clerk job with you guys for like, I think it was like six, seven bucks an hour. And like, now nah, we don't need you. I'm like, okay. So I went back to the magazine, started, you know, writing letters to everybody. Because you got to remember, this is before social media, before you could slide into DMs, mm-hmm. probably before cell phones, actually. So really, I mean, I would have a word processor. I would type out a letter and mail it and then try to follow it up with a phone call or whatever. Anyway, I got turned down by everybody and anybody, even Gordon Mott from Cigar Fishing on Magazine gave me a nice rejection letter um and the very last ad in that magazine was for cao international 830 kendall drive nashville tennessee that that, i'm like wow wait a second you know i might i might have a shot here i'm in nashville and that was it that was like my last ditch effort so i sent a a letter to jono rest in peace and heard nothing for like four months and i was just floundering in a temp job and uh, then i got the call from him one day to come on in for an interview so I interviewed twice. He says, I really don't need anything but a shipping manager. I'm like, I'm your guy. I'll be the best shipping manager ever. I need nothing. About shipping. <laughs> nothing. Absolutely, this is it. Mm-hmm. And, um, but once I got my foot in the door, I started to, I found ways to promote the company um, with a local rock radio format uh, station. Um, I actually talked my way into a, a drive time show for a few weeks. And I, I kind of got all of this collateral together dumped it on Jono's desk and he's like who's this guy he's really good we should hire him I'm like that's me he's like good you're fired from your shipping job you're hired in PR and promotions and so I was like in shipping for like five months and then uh, became the director of promotions and PR and then we fast tracked it and we just you know from that was like 96 and then you know the the ride was pretty quick because in 2008 I believe seven or eight is when the Oscars sold originally to Henry Winterman's um and then they were acquired. Winterman's was acquired by STG. So by 2010, I was that was my my undergrad degree was complete. So very good. That was what? Yeah, four, 14 years. Yeah, quite a while to uh, to stick with one company. And then of course uh, after right. after that, uh, we'll get into how how you came up with Crown Heads with your co-founder. But you are still in Nashville. What's the cigar mm-hmm. scene like for um, either a, a beginning smoker or a connoisseur that wants to visit the town and find some shops? Do you have some little hidden gems somewhere? Or? Great, great town for cigars, actually. Um, when we first started, when I first got into the business, it wasn't what it is now. Um, you had an uptown smoke shop, and that was pretty much the only gig. And there was an Elliston pipe shop on Elliston. And I think then Bell Mead Cigars launched. But now 
I mean, I, I don't even know half of the stores that exist in Nashville. I mean, there's Smoker's Abbey, you got Nashville Cigar, you got Franklin Cigar, you got a new cigar bar downtown, you got, I mean, it's just the list is long. It's Costa Monte Cristo in the Gulch. Um, I mean, you could just throw a stick and hit a, a great cigar store. Um, and fortunately, everybody really supports us um, as the local team, you know, the, the home team. So you, if you came to Nashville, you pretty much find Crown Heads everywhere and anywhere. And there's just some really good shops. Like, I love Smoker's Abbey in East Nash. Um, it's one of my favorites, personally, just because they get a lot of the boutique brands that are not necessarily available anywhere else. And so, you know, I, I don't mind picking up some, some other stuff that's interesting to try there. But, yeah, it's, Nashville's a great cigar scene. It's really good. It used to be, when I first got here, it used to be you could, like, have a steak in Morton's, and then they'd bring you, like, you know, the Davidoff selection, and you'd be able to <laughs> cut and light and smoke. Nice. Dude, good yeah. old days. Good old days. Now, no, you, you can't do that. But there's a great retail sector and a good lounge sector as well. I had the opportunity to go to, I think it was the uh, Red Phone booth uh, three or four years ago mm-hmm. when I was there. Um, definitely a different vibe from our shop here in Deadwood, but still enjoyable. Yeah. Very enjoyable. Yeah, it, it, Nashville in general just has a different vibe than it did when I first moved here. Um, now it's kind of like we've been invaded by guys dressed like lumberjacks and beards. <laughs> and wearing, like, no offense know. taken. No, I mean, these, at least there's a legitimate reason to do it where you guys are. But right. here, it's like, you know, the guys, the same guys that wear the wool beanies when it's like 80 oh, degrees yeah, outside. Yeah, yeah. yeah, I'm not one you of those. Yeah. Yep, yeah, I know exactly what you're talking about. So it's it's not not as kind of authentic, I'll just say, as it used to be. But um, times change, man. Sure. And being in Music City, did that have anything to do with... Um, some of the lines that you have with Crown Heads have a lot of music-inspired elements to them, whether in the name of the particular line of the cigar or the packaging of that. Is uh, that a passion of yours? Are you a big uh, music guy, or how did that mold into what you create? Just organically. I mean, I've always been a big music person, a music fan. Um, I mean, if you gave me my choice of like having TV in the house or music, like get rid of all the television sets. I don't care. I'd rather just hear music, and that's always been my thing. So, like when we did our inaugural release, Four Kicks, it came about because I was obsessing on this one song over and over and over and over. I, I think I have a little OCD. Um, same with Grange with Headley Grange. I was obsessing on this drum beat from Bonham over and over. You know, little things like that, the Johnny Cash influence, what have you. But not everything is influenced by music for me. I, I kind of got put in that box for a while and so but the recent stuff that i've done I, some of it may have been musically inspired but i i just stay away from that story because i'm not, i don't want to be like oh here's the next you know music cigar from these assholes in nashville or whatever you know? sure yeah, well, yeah i was waiting so. for your elegant chopin or bach or beethoven or brahms well, type hey man That's, I, I got the school on yeah. c major yeah yeah, yeah. see i wanted i, I wanted a, a c whole major orchestra. reference right there i wanted a whole orchestra <laughs> No, but sfumato is actually a painting technique. It's an, it's an old Renaissance painting technique where you round out all the edges so there's no edges and it's just all bleeds. It. That was my inspiration for that blend, which was an absolute disaster, by the way. <laughs> and, an epic, <laughs> and an epic fail. Yeah. So, uh, and, and, yeah. and that's actually, it's not good to hear, but it's rare in that we, when we've been doing these things. Most people always want to talk about their successes, but just in any business, if you take a mm. lot of chances, not everything's going to stick. Um, that's hundred percent right. That's true. Very true. Uh, and that was honestly one of my fails. Um, I, the way I, I landed on that is I just wanted a complete departure from like, I look, I looked at all the stuff we've been doing up to that point and we've been doing everything like heavy, dark San Andreas wrappers, Connecticut broadleaves, you know, like the whole, ugh. I was just like, I want to do something different. I'm just going to go 180. I'm going to go Connecticut shade and do something that you could smoke with a cup of coffee or a glass of chilled rosé wine. And I did, and that's I. It was actually exactly on point for what I was looking for, and then the inspiration, you know, the the whole story about Fumato and C major, C reference in Connecticut, um, just went like that, and everybody's just like, nah. <laughs> it was just, just so it was just a, it was a PCA exclusive, so it wasn't like the end of the world. But for me, if it doesn't sell out, it's it's a fail, and that one was a fail. So. Ah, well, big credit to Miguel because he was here for the last event that we had. And like you said, a lot of your stuff is in the heavier range. And I'd been smoking that for a few days. So I walked in. I was like, Miguel, what's the lightest thing you got in our humidor from your line? He's like, bam, smoke this. So, yeah, yeah. I still enjoy it. Mm-hmm. 
I said, <laughs> read between the lines. We still have some. <laughs> <laughs> Be looking for that next order from Deadwood Tobacco Company. Oh, man. Yeah, I'll give you a special prize bill on some autos. <laughs> Perfect. <laughs> Um, you had referenced uh, some of these guys down in Nashville, how the scene has changed, you know, in the wool beanies when it's 80. We see a lot yeah. of that younger generation coming into the shop now. Let's just say under 30 for, uh, for okay. a, a reference point. And we've seen a little bit of growth in that industry, uh, partly because of the aromatic sweet cigars, but not necessarily. Have you seen an expanse in that particular demo? Um, and if not, how do, you, how do you think we can capture and create more people who are interested in the lifestyle? Yeah, no, I, I've definitely seen a lot of younger smokers. Um, I mean, look, when you get as old as I am now, it's like everybody is younger, right? So you just kind of like start going, oh, shit, I didn't realize I was that old. But yeah, I think like, in, in fact, a lot of the people that may have followed CAO, like, you know, now that Tim's back, like, you know, and you, they don't remember CAO. They, rem- they know Crown Heads because it's a brand new customer, brand new, brand new demographic. And so we kind of have to reintroduce Tim and OFC and all that. Um, I just think it's changed, and which is fine. I, I like the injection of the younger uh, consumer because that's the guy and girl, or whatever, that are going to carry it on to the next generation. So it's just a natural progression. Um, and that, as far as like the aromatic stuff and all that, I, I think those are, are necessary. Like I know there's a big flavor ban, potentially this, that, and the other. But I've always looked at those as like a gateway cigar. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. Like my ga- my gateway cigar back in the day was a Macanudo Hyde Park. I, I, that was the first cigar I smoked, and it was the last Macanudo I smoked. But it was my gateway into the uh, into the other stuff, right? That was so back was when it was with, Jamaican, though. What? No. Like That's right. 95, 96? It was, no, it wasn't Jamaican, was it? No, it was When did they have the hurricane and the blue mold and all that shit in Jamaica when Macanudo? I remember went. the blue mold thing and all that crap. That's why they left um, and went to the DR. But, um... Anyway, yeah, sidebar. No, 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 no. Um... So that I, I think those are necessary because that the guy that smokes a, some aromatic thing or whatever, not everybody jumps in at an Opus X level, right? right? You know what I mean. Mm-hmm. And then you just kind of develop your palate from there and you go forward. So you know that was no, one of the, no, no qualms. That is one of the hardest things here, is the store is known for sweet stuff. Yes, and. We try to educate the team, and the team tries to educate the end result consumer. We've seen some of them make the leap mm-hmm. and transfer over into a traditional world and find the sweetness that way. But if we don't have a certain cigar some days that's sweet, then they're just like, all right, I'll have a bush light. Yeah, and then yeah, and I that, see that. I mean, even going back to when we first met, like I remember going to that event and thinking, oh, shit, you've got... Camacho, you got Ashton, you got CAO, and then Rocky. who's Drew State? Who's Rock? Yeah, I mean, it was like, Jonathan. obviously, we're going to, right, we're going to dominate the humidor. And I literally it was so humbling because I just sat there like a bump on a log and watched <laughs> Fabian from Drew Estate go back and forth with all these bikers going, You want Cuba Cuba? You want this? You want Blondie? You want that? But da, 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 da. He was just killing it. And we just, I was just like, the fuck i never would have thought like the biker. biker community would have right would have gravitated towards those cigars but that was an eye-opener for me it was a big education really humbling yeah so, it's and I'm, still huge with them yeah interesting interesting but we're working on that transition hopefully we'll have a little bit more detail on that in the future podcast coming up with some of our guests right bill yes sir very good so john you said uh 10 years now is that what you're coming up on or did you just celebrate with crown heads Oh, uh, gosh, we started, we announced Crown Heads February of 11, started shipping product November of 11. So this November will be a dozen years. A dozen yeah. years. There you go. Yeah. What's uh, what's yeah. exciting on the horizon, uh, not only for your lines, but maybe that you notice in the industry that, that gets your blood pumping? What's something that you see coming down the pipeline that's uh, exciting? You know, I, I don't know about industry trends because I don't really... I think if you pay attention as a brand owner to industry trends per se, that you, the best you could do is just follow the leader. But mm-hmm. when you just kind of stay in your own lane and create for creation's sake, then sometimes you can actually establish a trend as opposed to following one. Mm-hmm. So I don't know to answer that question accurately, like in terms of what I see coming down the pipeline with the industry. But like for us, we're just, you know, we're just crushing and pumping away. And I mean, I'm looking, I've been working on 2024 for a while. Um, 
and when I thought I had all of our stuff ready for PCA in March, as of this week, now my work is just doubled. It's like, oh, well, we're going to go in this direction now. And, you know, so it's, it's never, never ending process. So we have a lot of stuff coming. In fact, um, next month, we're going to drop our last LE of the year. Um, we just, I guess JR just announced an LE, well, it wasn't an LE, but it's the size extension exclusive for them, the Mildeus Box Press 555. Um, you know, Lavaretta's out there. Um, we've had it out for a couple months, and it's really ramping up. It's doing great, knock on wood. Um, it's just keeping it going, man. It's just like, you know, that guy in the, in the circus and the sideshow with all mm-hmm. the, the sticks, and they're spinning the place, and you got to spin this one, and mm-hmm. before that one falls down, you got to go spin that one kind of a thing. So, yeah, we're just kind of keeping busy, man. Just really trying to do it. And, and expanding. We're expanding. The main thing I should say is we're expanding our sales team. So that's something we're trying to be more aggressive with and get good quality guys in, in, in spots. And so we've hired two recently, uh, in-house guys, two more, and looking to do a three, maybe four before the end of the year. So, so as somebody with all of the plates spinning, head of a massive company working to expand, what do you do in, uh, what's the personal life like? The relaxation, the enjoyment. Uh, Bill tells a story that, uh, true or not, you can tell us, that you got, a, you got a time and you're like, I'm out of the office at this time because you have a life to live. Yeah, yeah, I'm very, he's right. I'm very, which is why we're doing this in the middle of the day. <laughs> um, uh, yeah, and it's true. Um, I'm just, I've always established that boundary ever since we started this. It's like I didn't want to be, I, I wanted to keep, you know, like the, the family and the business, like church and state. I wanted it separated and I, I wanted to compartmentalize. When I'm here, I'm the crown heads guy. And when I'm home, I'm Laura's husband and AJ's dad and Liam's dad. So, um, you know, I just, it's for me, it's very, it's a very firm line that I draw. Like, okay, if you guys want to do this, we can do this, but I got to be wheels on the road at 445 today or 345 or whatever that is. And so when I'm home, I'm like, that's my focus. I mm-hmm. try to turn everything else off. Um, in fact, I'll tell you, we just we just got back um, about a week ago from an annual trip that we do. Uh, I took my wife and daughter, and we go to Hawaii for the Paniolo exclusive, the Hawaii exclusive scar that we do, and they host us there for a week. So we came home. But during that trip, for the first time that I can remember in a long time, I just literally took my phone. And I put it in the hotel safe, and I just left it there for like two days. And it was, I, it was the most liberating thing to me. It was mm-hmm. just like, I don't give a fuck. I don't care. Who's calling. Anybody I need to know right now is right with me here. And like my daughter, my wife, whatever, you know. And it was just like, I didn't care. I just I completely went off the radar for two days. It was great. So I have no problem doing that. I mean, those they're my priority. And um, that's, so when I'm not here, um, I'm home. When I'm home, I'm just enjoying stupid stuff, man. Like tomorrow night is our, you know, every every Friday night we have a tradition in my family. Um, we do family pizza movie night. So I, I take the mattress I'm from upstairs, I bring it downstairs, <laughs> put it on the media room floor. Mm-hmm. My daughter lays there. I crash on the couch. The three of us have pizza. We watch a couple of Disney movies and we stay up and then we go to sleep and wake up. And just, it's, I look forward to that night more than any night, you know. So... Yeah, I'm just a simple, boring ass family. Dude, basically. <laughs> That's quite all right. Yeah. We have one of those here too. Grimes will be happy to know that there's another one out there in the world. <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm. You know, I'm, I'm probably the oddball in the industry in terms of like brand owners. Like, I don't, I don't drink, I don't gamble, I don't go to strip clubs, and I don't play golf. <laughs> so, <it's> like, <laughs> you know what I mean? So, like, I got nothing in common with anybody, you know. But I'd still have good friends in the, in the industry, but, you know, not a lot in common, but except for cigars. And to do something like that, to, to be the head of the company and to be able to have that time when you're checked out means that you've got a great team working for you. Oh, yeah. And uh, we, we've met a few of them. I've only been around the, the industry here for about a year with Bill, a uh, smoker for a few years before that. Can you talk a little bit about your team and, and uh, what you see as, uh, as their strengths and what they bring to Crown Heads, especially the new sales team? You said you're expanding. What are you looking for when they go out and about to retail? Well, to your point, yeah. I mean, you, if you surround yourself with talented people, I mean, that's 80% of the battle. I'm not the smartest guy in the room. I'm not trying to be the smartest guy in the room, but I'm fortunate that... We have surrounded ourselves with a team of really great guys, um, some of which I've known longer than I've known my wife, um, you know, starting with Adam Shepard here in the office. I mean, Adam and I started at CAO 
probably two weeks from each other back in 96. Adam's been with us almost since the start of Groundheads. And he's, I always look at Adam as like the backbone. Uh, pragmatic, financial, logistics, whatever it is, he is like the go-to. We call him money. Hmm. Um, and then, of course, Miguel. You guys know Miguel very well. Um, I, when we started the company, I wanted to get, I mean, the intent was to start with Miguel as the NSM, as the national sales manager. And then he had another opportunity with another company. So that, that failed, went after him, I think another time and got close, turned it down. And I went after him one more time in 2017. I'm like, if I told Condor, my business partner, I said, if, if he doesn't jump on board now, fuck it, it wasn't meant to be, but we got him <laughs> and he was a good cat. He's, I think Miguel is is one of the best, if not the best, at what he does. Yep. Um, great national great. sales manager, great people person, amazing, positive attitude, knowledgeable, I mean, just an all-around great guy. It's, it's a joy to spend time with that guy. It really is. He was in your last couple of days in the office. He's a solid dude. Um, and then, you know, of course, my condor, my business partner who started this all with me, um, she, I owe him a lot. He's been a mentor, you know, for years. He used to be my boss at CAO, basically, when mm-hmm. we restructured the, the marketing department. And he just said, hey, when this is over, do you want to do something together? And I'm like, yeah. And that was as formalized as it got. Nice. And then we just we went from there, you know. Um, but, yeah, just very fortunate to have. And in our sales team, we got, you know, Jake. I, I call him Jake from State Farm. But it just <laughs> <laughs> we got Jake. We got Brian. Brian came on in 2014. Um just hired a guy, uh, Craig, out in Arizona. I haven't met him yet, except to Zoom. And um, and we just picked up a, a, a guy, Andy Yaffe, from, he used to be with uh, McAuliffe. He was the national sales manager, I believe, from McAuliffe. And he just came on board with us as of October 1. So he was a wonderful get. I'm looking forward to big things from him. So we're making some pretty good moves, and we just have really good people. We have good guys, and just, you know, I mean, it, it, it's one thing to be good at something. It's another thing to, like, really get on with somebody and go okay i trust that guy like you know what i mean as i kind of use like but i but i let so-and-so babysit my daughter yeah i trust him you know what i mean i can say that pretty much about everybody except for maybe my condor because he gets a little weird about things like that but (laughs) um i'm just kidding but uh there is that that sincere connection and trust and it's like we're we're part of a real like like a brotherhood a fraternity so it's it's nice very good Ethan, do you have anything uh, more for John? Um, John, how, how, what's in your wheelhouse, man? What's what would you say? How you're... come Ethan doesn't have a mic? You got a mic in, the, in like the back closet or something? He's, he's, like, he's I over... just hear this voice from way back. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> we, we ran out of cell phones for the cameras. That's yeah. what happened. Oh, okay. Yeah. Yeah. Sorry, what's, Ethan. What was your question? What's your wheelhouse, man? If, what's the unique contribution and the role that you play? Like, the, if if you're the guy who can bring one thing what's how do you see your role functioning at crown heads what do i do basically what you're asking <laughs> I'm, I'm gonna what, what is it that you do i think my wife asked me <laughs> what do you do um you know what i i, I kind of go back to this interview i saw with rick rubin um i was like a 60 minutes interview mm-hmm. and I, I can't remember the deal i was interviewing but the guy asked rick rubin he's like do you play any instruments and he said no because can you work a mixing board? No, I have no technical ability whatsoever. And he's like, well, what do you get paid for? What is it that you do, you know? And he like closed his eyes and he came up with this really esoteric answer. But basically he was just saying, my value is that I validate what people do. People respect my opinion, what have you, blah, blah. Anyway, it's, it's a great interview. Nice. And I kind of look at myself in, in that same light. It's like, my job isn't to sit here and roll a cigar. Um, my job is is kind of as a producer. I'm like, you know, the the, the musicians are the Ernesto Perez Carrillos, the Jaime Garcias, the Radio Pichardo. Those are the musicians, and I'm just producing the album. I'm just the one that's kind of, you know what I mean? Turn Putting up the volume here, turn it down there. Yeah, that's all I do. And I, I'm I, I think uh, I think Pete referred to himself as like a um, what was he calling himself? Like not a validator, but something along that line. And I'm I'm kind of the same thing. I'm like. I look at myself as somebody that just has a vision of something and, and uses very good talent to get that end result, validate it, produce it, and here it is. You know what I mean? That's kind of what I do. So it's it, it's a hard question to answer definitively and, and concisely, 
But I can tell you what I don't do. I don't blend cigars. I validate the blends. I, I you know, I, I can't work on a computer and, and do Photoshop and shit like that. I mean, I literally, I'll take a buck slip and I'll sketch something out, take a picture of it, send it to my graphics guy and go, this is what I want to do. And then we'll work on it together, that kind of a thing. So I, I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm a talentless wreck when it comes to any of this shit, <laughs> to be honest with you. But, you know, here I am 11 years or later and 14 years at CAO. So, um, yeah, I, I would look at myself more as the producer than, than the artist or even like a creative director, like a, like a Pharrell Williams, who just who's the uh, LVMH creative director in Louis Vuitton. Mm hmm. He does not. He doesn't. I'm guarantee you, Pharrell Williams does not a sew a, a fucking no anything. He doesn't mm -hmm. sew a patch on a pair of jeans, but he can. He's got the ideas in his head, and he uses his resources to create what's in his head and make it a commodity and, and a, a and tangible product. And that's that's closest to what I do. I think I have a new title for my business card, Bill. I want it to say "Tobacconist, Podcast Host, Talentless Wreck." We can do that. Yeah. Perfect. I think I'm going to take that too. <laughs> TM, right here. You got it. Yeah. Bill, anything I'm else? Not big, I'm not a big titles guy. I, I, you know, I never give out business cards, but there's no title on that card. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? I just, I've almost looked at titles as like a joke. Mm -hmm. Like back at CAO, I remember, um, I remember I wanted to, because I was in charge of kind of marketing at the time, whatever, and I wanted to be the minister of propaganda. <laughs> and they wouldn't, they wouldn't let me do it. So I took, I, I literally, I had a friend that worked at Red Bull and he was the director of lifestyle marketing. I'm like, that sounds kind of cool. And so that was my, my business card, director of lifestyle marketing. So. Oh, very good. And that's what we always preach here. It's not a habit. It's not um, a vice. It's a lifestyle. The premium cigar enjoyer. It's, it's a culture, right? Yep. It's a culture. I, I believe that. I believe that. Bill, anything that you want to add with uh, with John? Nothing other than good wishes and prosperity, sir. Bill, you have too many questions, man. Just, yeah. You're, just, you're like, you just stood off to the side and just kind of make sure everybody acts right, huh? I'm a facilitator. We got to we got to we got to have one handsome guy on the podcast. I have dreams so. that I allow them to facilitate to become real. Seems like, like a, a theme for the the podcast today. There you go. There you go. Yeah. All good. Well, All very good. good. Word. All right. Yay. Well, that's going to wrap it up for episode number 40 this weekend. We'll let you know what's coming up after a short little break and once again from Crown Heads, Nashville, Tennessee. Make sure you check them out. Make sure you go see Miguel whenever he's at a shop near you. Make sure you stop in and buy some delicious Crown Head products here at Deadwood Tobacco Company. Mr. John Huber. Thanks very much. Thanks, guys. It's been a pleasure. Thanks for spending time with the DTC Blow and Smoke podcast. Don't forget to like, comment, subscribe, and share on YouTube or wherever you get your podcasts. 